cut because now we get to a talk that I am very fond of personally because some of my best friends have critical infrastructure and it is a kind of thing in this pandemic, uh, you have to say, have to, to deal with this infrastructure. And so I'm even the more happier to have, as far as you can say, have Honkhase in this room or Manuel Atug, as his uh, civil name goes. Honk is one of the co-founders of the critical infrastructure working group and he does a lot with security. If you look at his track record, 23 years in information security and you have to say in the end, this is an old hare as the German saying goes, an old rabbit. So, wow, thanks for all the experience points that you are contributing to this talk and at this point, well, the, what talk is it going to be? Yes, critical infrastructure in times of the pandemic. And everyone that is lucky enough to work in groups that are regarded as critical, uh, well, you can report about your experiences and you can listen as well and, and maybe learn a bit more. And at this point, I would just like to say applause and go ahead, honk, the stage is yours. Yes, thank you, Pupe. And I have given a talk uh, from the point of view of a critical infrastructure um, auditor and um, that was interesting to see how critical infrastructure is actually being provided and today I'm going to show you a few topics about critical infrastructure in times of a pandemic, the things that uh, keep things running in the background as it were. Okay, but Puppe did say I um, have been in this for 23 years now my core issues are critical infrastructure. That is a passion hack back because uh, we want to see threats about of two critical infrastructure, ethics, cyber resilience, and protecting the population because ultimately we do want to keep being able to type vigorously. So how to secure that? That is what I'm going to talk about a little. But before we go into that, I would like to, to define the critical terms, as it were, because the legal definitions are in no way trivial. So let's have a run through those so that you can actually have some insights later on to see what the legal foundations are and how easy or complex it is. And then I'll give you six examples that I brought along. So legal definitions of operators of critical infrastructure. Who is an operator of critical infrastructure? Let's start from the top. Uh, through the various levels, the European Union defined it in a regulation called NIS. Version 1.0 is enforced, 2.0 is being worked upon. So um, this is about operators of relevant services. There are seven services that are identified, and this is about defining measures to ensure that a common security level of information system and network system is in place. Sounds sensible, not so trivial to implement, and from this regulation, the IT security law uh, was deduced. And now let's go to the Federal Republic of Germany. There is a unique definition of crit critical infrastructure on the federal and federal state levels. And these organizations <clears throat> or institutions with importance for the state structure and where the failure or limitation would <clears throat> lead to dramatic or sustained bottlenecks in supply and disturbances of public security or other dramatic consequences. It sounds drastic, but that's what it is. If the health structure, for example, were not working in a pandemic, uh, we would have a real crisis on our hands, as the pandemic already is. And in addition to these seven sectors, we have two more that are a bit separate in Germany or special. The first one is state and administration, and the second is media and culture. Uh, state and administration um, cannot just be regulated, can be regulated by the Federal Office for Information Security, and media and culture is re regulated at the federal state level. So you have to look at the individual states and not 
uh, get involved there from a higher level. Uh, and then we have the German IT security law 1.0, which is used from the NIS regulation, as I've said. Um, so that is the law to increase security of, of information technology systems. Um, so this covers, well, ultimately the objectives that we talked about, uh, securing IT infrastructure and improving IT security in the federal administration. Well, <laughs> improving protection for people on the in the internet. And the sectors here are more or less the same that were defined by the EU. So energy, transport and traffic, finance and, and insurances, health, water, uh, nutrition and information technology and communication technology. And the 2O law is being worked upon just as the regulation 2O is being worked upon. But again, um, yeah, from the IT security law, there are some further things that are deduced in the law about the uh, German Federal Authority for Security and Information Technology. So this defines their tasks and, and their rights and <clears throat> their uh, rights regarding an increasing uh, relevance of these technologies. And so we have these German-wide sectors and these two uh, special cases that are laid down in the law about the BSI, the Federal Agency for Information Security, um, and that regulates both the agency and the operators. And linked to that, we're still not finished with the legal foundations. So one more I have, there is the uh, BSI regulation on critical infrastructure, which defines threshold values for the each individual sector, the performance they have to um, provide. So uh, water, for example, or sewage, the, these are two categories. Someone who runs uh, <coughs> infrastructures like that. <coughs> um, um, and the threshold values here mean that at what point an operator um, or service provider in the sector has to be regarded as a critical provider and it's quite easy the threshold values in each of these sectors are blanket values that say 500 people 500,000 people <clears throat> that is the measure so if you provide 500,000 people say with the average amounts of water or electricity uh, then if, the, if that is the capacity you have you are critical um, <clears throat> so one more um, there are regulations at the federal state level too so I picked the federal state of North Rhine-Westphalia um, and they have a corona operating regulation there that has been updated as well, so some definitions were taken out. Um, the paragraph I quote on this slide does no longer exist, but they did try to say, well, we have to regulate the protection from reinfection in uh, um, daycare, for example, or important services or services critical to the system. Um, so every regulation calls it differently. Every federal state has its own regulation. So the several classical sectors are named, and that includes state administration at the federal state level too, and the media, but also schools, support for children, young people, or dis disability people with disabilities. So all the kind of infrastructure where you have to protect people from being reinfected. And the federal states, of course, that is quite scary. There was a lot of back and forth there between about competencies and that is still in flux. But so much about the overview and uh, now we have time for the six examples I brought along. So, one challenge that became visible early last year, uh, uh, as early as January, it was addressed with operators of critical, critical infrastructure. Um, so way before the first, uh, let's call it lockdown, home office, or whatever. So as early as January, these people dug out their pandemic concepts and said, okay, we have to respond there. Some some people, some operators came afterwards in February, um, 
but this was actually realized ahead of time. There were no actual failures that were, became known, but um, keeping staff ready um, was important to make sure the services could still be provided. I cannot operate um, a, a plant without a water plant without keeping the pumps going, making sure that water purity is sustained. Um, so there are some high demands on uh, drinking water, tap water, as compared to bottled water, for example. Um, so what was the scenario there? Well, traveling of staff from their residences to the workplace. Um, so public transport wasn't operating at some point. So if they uh, form carpools, of course, there is an infection risk. Contact to other people, these people go home and are in touch with families, shop assistants and whatever. And exposition to an infection with COVID-19 was, of course, always possible. So how do you deal with that? And the consequences um, were um, staff being unavailable, and infection risks within the staff. So how can we act against that was the question. Of course, there are concepts for a pandemic, or some uh, updated them spontaneously, uh, or just dusted them off and uh, looked at them again. But many had working constructs in place, and you have to say it's not that bad, but the challenge definitely was there. So what, what did the solutions look like if you have a control room for, uh, say, a power station, a water plant, you have to make sure that the system, the critical team is isolated, the people that run these control rooms, but also electricians uh, that have to fasten a screw or something, that those people are on site. And these people have to be provided with accommodation because they were isolated, so they really are separated. Uh, they had to have been they, they they had to sleep at the workplace these places would activate it or provide it and um, and most of these <coughs> were asked whether they wanted to voluntarily self self isolate um, depending on the cycles they have um, <clears throat> so they would be given a bonus for that and the public the, the population is going to love you and of course you can stay in touch with your family but remotely please so we, we will provide that of course and we will provide <clears throat> sleeping arrangements and all that what you had also to take in mind was of course daily needs such as washing machines food <clears throat> both pre-packed and to some extent fresh food uh, through a security lock um, so that these people could be resupplied and uh, a certain protection could be put in place um, and to maintain all that, disinfect all that, that was an extra effort. So drinking water was supplied. Uh, these people didn't have water on tap. Um, they were also given drinking water, tea or coffee. Coffee. Yeah, of course. Um, so everything you need as daily provisions would be there and, and uh, the supplier was insured. And what also had to be insured was psychological care. Um, and a psychological care and, and keep keeping people op occupied outside work hours. If you keep seeing the same three, four people all the time, it's tough. You have the family outside in this unclear situation. Just think back, March, April, April May last year, nobody really knew what would happen. There were new studies coming out every day almost with new findings and politics said, oh yeah, we do this. No, we won't do it. And now we'll change. And so the in this situation, to leave your family alone and, and just go to save the general population. That is a lot of pressure. And there was care needed for that where it was necessary. It was provided. And of course, there were always individual cases where that was forgotten uh, or wasn't provided well. Many individual cases, if you look to hospitals or care homes, the health sector, of course, wasn't too well handled by politics, as we all know. Um, just imagine 
going on your back, going onto your balconies at eight and, and giving applause, but then <clears throat> when wage uh, negotiations took place, uh, suddenly uh, no wage rise was agreed. So that kind of pressure doesn't really help you stay motivated and uh, <clears throat> So all this came together, uh, so staff that was critical, uh, measures were taken to compensate for any losses, and large operators such as nuclear power station control rooms said, we have one operating team on site and another team independently isolated in another place, in separate rooms perhaps, or in another location. So if for some reason the main team would be infected by COVID and, and we would not be able to prevent that, these people might all just fail and uh, we have to have another team available. And some even had a third one. So the worst case scenario, some in some services was that two teams would become unavailable and still services had to be provided and this went on mostly in the background there was hardly any press coverage um, I think Municipal Works in Vienna reported you can do some research but mostly for many years these services are run in the background so there is not that much public awareness so a huge thank you to all system critical operators all the people that went into isolation and that did their shifts all the time in times of crisis that is a huge thank you it's worth a huge thank you and i bow to you and I give you my respect. Yeah, second challenge. What else did we have? We were talking about fresh water, and then there has to, the water has to be removed somehow, so sewage. What did we have? What challenges did we have? People were panic buying toilet paper, so um, consumers um, were not provided with toilet paper, but the industry products, they were there. If you have these huge loo rolls that you have in industry and and uh, and use them for home purposes and everyone you then starts using industry products in the domestic area then of course these products cannot be simply exchanged because the um, factory lines are different so in this including panic buying led to blockages and logistics was a challenge too because large roles have to be packed quite differently um, so the, normally you run this in pallets but um, the number of packages per packet per, per pallet was quite different the use of alternatives was regarded as a challenge um, so you have um, handkerchiefs, <clears throat> moist tissues, and these are actually ripping resistance in contrast to toilet paper that dissolves. So we're talking about alien objects in the sewage, and that, of course, would then impede sewage plants. You would have blockages there, and uh, or you have to uh, change your cleaning procedures which gives you more waste, that solid waste that you have to dispose of. So even the lorry drivers that transported the solid waste away uh, uh, led to um, Dep um, deposits uh, being critical as well. So there was a kind of self-regulation by retail regarding panic buying. Um, people were not given indefinite amounts of toilet paper and production was changed as well. So you had mottos such as everyone can only buy one packet of toilet paper or the first one will be 3.99 and this, every second package will be 15 euro for the those that say I'm not going, I'm not panic buying, but um, still. So, um, use of alternatives and problems in sewage plants. That was a problem because, as I said, these alternatives could lead to blockages. Uh, so, the sewage plant operators were communicating about uh, alternatives such as mobile B days. Um, 
<clears throat> showering perhaps. Um, so people were trying to keep people from inserting solids into the sewage system. Um, and that, I think, went ahead mostly in tra in tra in transparently. Um, I was in touch with operators, but um, that has not been very much noticed. And then you have computing centers in a quarantine area. Uh, if there are <coughs> curfews and you cannot reach your computing center, how do the staff get there? Um, so getting in touch with the health services to get special permits, that's something you have to take care of. And uh, at this point, they didn't quite know uh, <coughs> these health, um, local health uh, authorities didn't quite know what their responsibilities were. So I, for one, was given a special permit from my employer because I do services for operators of critical service infrastructure. So if, if I were to visit someone's uh, plant or office, which was quite rare from February, but it did occur, I did have the option to have this receipt together with my ID in my pocket and I could go. So that was the one thing. And the other was implementing journal-based asynchronous replication over large distances. So you had redundant structures in a non-quarantine area, ideally. Um, but if there is a worldwide pandemic, then there is no guarantee that all perhaps uh, red, all redundant locations would be subject to curfews. So that was a challenge too. And that quite, went quite smoothly normally. But yes, all my colleagues and all the, the others worked together and they said, hey, go there and this is the template and this is the text and just do it, do it. And time's, time's of the essence. Then limit in the uh, in, in the shops. We talked about toilet paper. We're now talking about new uh, noodles. Um, the, in the beginning, everything was there, but all the supply chain did not work. The just-in-time delivery did not work, and the, there were limits in the. Um, in, in storage facilities, and because of the border controls, uh, especially from Poland to Germany, sometimes there were over 60 kilometers of, of traffic, and it took days for them to arrive to Germany. And truck drivers who arrived sometimes had to sit in quarantine for 14 days before they can could return, and sometimes got ill here or drove outside and, uh, and and got ill there and of course there were significant some real issues um, but there were also a, a 14 day wait time and therefore they could not exchange quickly enough turn around quickly enough the uh, additional storage uh, the, 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 there were temporal limits, uh, te temporal, uh, what was done against that? Aldi said, oh yeah, these uh, pesta deficit is not appropriate, um, we have to move more by rail and with DB Schenker, the German railway, uh, they said, okay, Let's don't do use trucks, but use the Bishenka, use the 16 ton noodle uh, past my tally, and that way we don't have a deficit. Of course, that took a while uh, until it was changed around. There were regulatory issues uh, between the different trade partners. There were new new contracts, and the, the, the Deutsche Bahn had to uh, had to work with that and how can we deliver that by train to the storage point and how do we get them there 
There's a lot of work to keep the supply chain up to date, but in the end everything worked. We all had toilet paper and, and, and pasta and everything and food and everything. So the goods were quickly re-established. Then we had um, issues with waste disposal, not only with the, um, but, but also the private rubbish. The removal of uh, rubbish removal is not a critical infrastructure according to the regulations, but that also leads to issues if it does not happen. Happen, both in the environment and with the health issues. The, the recycling centers were closed, and but also the pickup was less less often. So, so trash pickup wasn't uh, because there were less employees at a time. And how can we get around that? There were some solution issue uh, thoughts. Uh, one was that uh, uh, rubbish. Waste disposal was, it might be added to critical infrastructure, to the list of critical infrastructures, and the result to how uh, how the waste is handled is, is also an issue. There might be coronavirus through, through waste disposal, because uh, that's burned at a hard, hotter temperature, and all waste from hospitals in that had coronaviruses were transported as uh, dangerous materials, and that means they had to be transported differently, but uh, that, that also happens sometimes. A few towns called on their inhabitants to to, to change that. But if you're ill, you first of all think about members in your family and not how to dispose of your waste. And then there was also the question of IT infrastructure in hospitals. There were ransom attacks on hospitals. So uh, thank you for the incident response people that that they try to keep the IT infrastructure of hospitals and surgeries up to date everywhere and running despite despite viruses and everything and ransomware. So, but if there is ransomware, there are changes in the in in, in, in how hospitals can be run. With the ransomware, there are limited information to patients and limits in the uh, laboratory capacity, so that all increases the issues. So there was a Corona in, uh, a test center that was attacked, and there's a crisis within the crisis. We have the crisis pandemic, and then there is an additional crisis with ransomware. So if if a crisis is bad and a crisis within a crisis is even worse. So what can we do? Work, do IT security properly. Keep stick to the rules and regulations. There is a uh, a special law about the future of hospitals where IT infrastructure money is available. It was delayed for years, but I, you can also take IT security companies to help you. Sometimes they even have specialists because they are cyber um, insurance that can help you to restart your your infrastructure. Sometimes really strange infrastructure with the Windows 1995 and uh, old, old infra uh, protocols. 
and they need a crisis management that can handle two crises at the same time. That's, yeah, and then those are all points that can help against the attack of interest, uh, uh, ransomware. So, let's some uh, a link to the my last talk on the uh, DVOC, the PPT from last year, about how it is to work as a great Kritis uh, um, verifier. Uh, who, which is about yeah and thank you very much and we will go back to the questions and answers can't hear anything yet yeah well that, that is this mute button that is sometimes critical even especially in tacos yeah sometimes various things my ear can be critical yeah applause applause you may have only seen it at first thank you so much for this talk and well it's one module coming into place after the next i wonder what your next talk is going to be maybe this is going to be a sequence of lectures that you can access from media.ccc.de and that might may actually get some good funding uh, now about the questions and comments in the pad uh, the link to the pad is to be found in the page on this talk and you can write into this pad in real time now i will see that okay and while i say that of course new questions are coming in so how about heating infrastructure isn't that part of critical infrastructure too well yeah heating infrastructure i think that is building heating i think that is down that is a these individual components are not part of critical infrastructure <clears throat> But um, there are components that are the um, mass supply, such as power stations that provide electricity or district heating, um, refineries that uh, produce fuels, um, the heating network in a large house is the individual case, the individual supply. That is not part of the definition of critical infrastructure, because if that fails, um, you can <coughs> call for someone to repair that, but if you have district heating, where a whole downtown district is supplied, You've, we've seen that in Texas when they had uh, the snowstorm, uh, they had a complete blackout. <coughs> So, you had people there saying that they would provide their own network, uh, which meant that people, when that failed, had no heating and no water. And that was at a time when it was quite cold, so the water pipes froze and burst. And when they thawed and when electricity was back, now all these uh, burst pipes then leaked and so that went um, led to water damage so that was the power network that failed uh, yeah you can listen to american podcasts uh, that is quite a drama yeah now uh, next question there uh, how about um, <coughs> craftspeople, or, uh, well, they would have to be supplying more than 500,000 people in order to be regarded critical craftsmen. I, I don't know. Um, now, regarding wholesale, um, uh, people that supply Metro and others, those that supply retail um, with foods, um, the food they sell, uh, that is critical infrastructure if they supply more than 500,000 people. And that is the case with some companies in retail or wholesale. And dairies, of course, as well which are in the food sector as well. 
So, companies that are regarded as critical to their softness by um, kind of inheriting that status uh, towards their suppliers, is that inherited to, by the suppliers of those critical infrastructures? Well, if I am a critical uh, operator, then I have to make sure that my uh, um, <coughs> devices uh, can keep running. It's not just the IT part of it. Um, there is a law on the IT for that. <coughs> so the there is the technology that keeps the process running. You have to make sure that the suppliers for, for those IT components that can access it remotely if necessary. That's a nightmare in itself, which I I talked about the experience of one operator in, in the other talk, um, because uh, the the remote maintenance archaeologist had to be had to be invoked. So all this has to be regulated in contracts with those suppliers. But what does not what is not inherited is the status from the basic supply chain. The basic supply is fundamental, but for a dairy, perhaps to make sure that trucks can still reach and that is no longer connected, connected to IT and <coughs> whether that arrives or not, I'm not, not quite sure. Um, okay, on with the questions. To what extent is critical infrastructure IT and what is just simply provision of I don't know, basic existence. Well, there are about 200,000, uh, 2,000 critical infrastructures in Germany. That is, I think, 1,600 plant categories are registered. Um, so, plants that supply more than 500,000 people. In general, emergency supply, which is which encompasses much more, uh, crisis management of federal states, um, the federal government, uh, that all comes into play here. The <coughs> German Red Cross, for example, or the volunteers, <coughs> fire brigades, that's all part of a disaster response. And what helps in extreme emergencies which, which is um, kind of failed by design, um, things you'd only use in emergencies, and you try to get off using these structures, because um, if you have to rely on these extra capacities permanently, then any further disturbance will make that fail. And uh, I don't know if there are numbers um, apart from what's published, the um, technical response teams have about 85,000 volunteers or 85,000 members, many of them volunteers, and you cannot break this down too well. Okay, what is your idea about the finance, your impression of the finance sector? So, um, payment services directive two, no login without two-factor authentication. Um, <clears throat> well, you have to say that <clears throat> this sector, finance and insurance, if you just look at the banking part of that, and leave insurances aside, then these people have old systems in place <coughs> with complex infrastructures. I think Deutsche Bank had about 7,000 various applications and core components, and one application can be as complex as you wish, but you have to be fair and say that they are fairly much regulated. So, if there is an incidents at a bank, it has to be reported to the European Central Bank, the German Federal Bank, um, their own insurances, if they have any, but most do. You have to report to the authorities on finance and IT. So they are perhaps over-regulated or strongly regulated. So if you look at the US provisions there, um, you have branches in the US and you have to report to New York then, if you have Singapore, if 
which re demands a local office with their own regulations. So you have to issue a separate report there. And uh, we were not, well, say, e-money licenses at the UK stock exchange. So you can report and report to exhaustion and you have all these regulations that sometimes contradict, so it's not by no means trivial, um, where millions of people uh, work and, and expect their money to come out of the ATMs. So you can't just quickly adapt this. So it's not kind of, it's kind of bad, it's over-regulated. Um, but on the other hand, it's, it's bad um, because it leads to a never change of running system situation. If you touch it, it will all explode, so no one wants to touch it. So, sneak preview, the IT security law 2.0 will introduce all that, it will become more senseless, so I'm worrying already, uh, all the six experts in the German parliament, I was one of them, um, were against that, even those connected to the conservatives, but simply the ministry wasn't interested and, and said, oh yeah, we're the best, our new law is going to be great. And yeah, finally, I had to just think of that hearing because in that hearing, you talked so much and you never reached the end. And there, there are more and more questions in the pad too. So while we talk, ever more questions come in. Uh, it's, it's very interesting to see what comes in. Now, how about logistics? Why isn't that critical yet? Because without logistics, no infrastructure can work, right? Well, that's easy. The uh, transport and traffic infrastructure, well, everything that supplies more than 500,000 is covered. Next question. Um, to what extent do you look at packets, package versions and dependencies if, if you work with customers? I think many certifications, it seems, did only check whether libx has the newest version, but what people don't seem to look at, how old, how dated, how buggy is that newest version? Well, a critical infrastructure check is only a check, it's not a certification, so there is no badge. You just get told whether you have adhered, adhered to the legal requirements. Um, but the, the, the problem with certifications, of course, is known to me because I know a few certifiers. So perhaps the, if these people don't know what secure software means and what life cycle changes and upgrades and, and how to what extent you have to look at dependencies, not every feature, maybe there is a feature I don't want to don't care about, but how about a security upgrade? But many then do not look at the libraries because they don't look so deeply because and that of course is kind of sad because that is one of the big gaps that you can encounter. <clears throat> yeah, then there were new results about criticality, about infrastructures that were not regarded as critical. In, so, pharma production, uh, care home supplies, European cloud providers, cloud computing. Um, yeah, for me, yeah, for the critical infrastructure working group too, but for the operators and the employees, yes, but for some um, business uh, institutions, maybe not the German government, yeah, well, and, and the interior ministry, ah, oh, yeah, sure, we'll just add uh, waste deposits disposal and then we'll be fine, and then there's funny, and then here and there add something and then it's all great. My personal opinion is that was a complete fail and failure here because the real needs were not addressed. Um, they just covered things up and said, oh, everything's fine, that's what it looks like, yeah. Now, a very interesting question, how about the food industry? Is there a difference there that's being made between, say, a dairy and a candy factory? No. <clears throat> if you supply more than 500,000, if you, if you have to ensure that supply, then you are regarded as critical. But there are different categories of, of plants, uh, so production, etc., of food, etc., and these categories. If you are in one of these categories and you supply more than 500,000 people, um, uh, one example that is a bit outside is alcohol, because uh, it's been said that water is just about water and not alcoholic drinks. 
Oh, jetzt kommt die letzte Frage. <coughs> Now we get to the last question. What is the most vulnerable, the most brittle sector, I think, uh, with the highest risk of failure? That's electricity. That is the basis of everything. If that fails, then telecommunication fails, and everything else will then fail. If you want to look into that further, then read Blackout by Mark Ellsberg. That is quite close to reality. And then there is the TA Bundestag. The German Parliament has uh, commissioned a um, blackout study in 2012, which is a long document. And they really did scientific research what would happen in a blackout, in what order things would fail. And if that isn't enough for you, then you may read 42 degrees, which is of 42 Grad, which is a book that describes it all from the point of view of water. But electricity is clearly the basis for everything. Um, Telecommunication is, yeah, of course, quite central as well. So thank you, thank you, thank you for the talk, for the answers. And the three questions that are still there, uh, the, uh, the answers will surely be added. Uh, so you can comment on those. And you can leave your feedback there. Uh, and another virtual applause, applause, applause. And now let's return to the main program. And I'm. Um